This morning we're going to be doing part two of my sermon series on was Noah's flood regional or worldwide? I made a mistake last week. I said was it local or regional? Um, they're the same thing. It's regional or worldwide. I didn't catch that till later on. Um, actually, they didn't. I caught it that time. I caught it. Believe it or not. Stuff like that slide. Yeah, sure. Uh, no, I caught it. I caught it that time. Um, the goal of this series is, and this is the ending of this part, I mainly wanted to focus on Scripture in this series, not all the scientific evidence and, you know, the, the size of the ark, which we're going to talk about that a little bit in this one, and everything else. We're just focusing on Scripture. But um, the goal of this series is to just give another point of view. Now, I think we're all on the same page on this, but it's good to kind of know what we believe and how we believe it. So... Um, I think last week, you know, we looked at the word all and every and erits and land, earth, ground. Um, it's very possible to look at Scripture and Scripture alone and come to that interpretation. It's not out of the realm of possibility, although people who adhere to a global flood, uh, they act like that it's something completely bizarre. But it's actually not. And it's, it's believed by more people than a lot of people think. Even uh, Haley's Bible Handbook, uh, he was an adherent to a local flood that he wrote about in his handbook, along with a lot of other people. And um, it's growing in popularity because and I'm not saying this to offend those who, who agree with a global flood. It just makes more sense, at least it does to me, in Scripture and then everything else we have in the world that we understand. So last week, just as way of review, um, we talked about literalism. And the flood account or even anything else in Scripture, when we read those things, are they to be taken 100% literal? And I think we answered that no, they can't be taken literal, even though those who call themselves literalists will a lot of times say that they're taking it literal, everything literal. Um, there's a lot of figure of speech in Scripture, and we are, a lot of times Christians are dishonest when it comes to Scripture because they will use language in their own day-to-day -day life, and then they'll read other literature as well, and they'll use figure of speech, they'll read figure of speech, but when we get to Scripture, somehow we think there's no such thing as figures of speech in Scripture. Um, and there's a lot of figures of speech there's per, in different types. We won't go into all the different types. Um, for example, the word, um, the word Eretz we talked about last week. It can mean earth, land, countries, ground. And we review, reviewed a series of scriptures in Genesis 6 and 7 that um, used that word. And then we used, looked in other passages in the Bible how it would be impossible for it to always mean the entire earth as well as the word every and all and things like that in the Scripture. So let's go ahead and let's turn to Genesis chapter 6. And let's look at verse 13. We're just going to look at a few different verses before we get on our main, uh, main objective this morning. And this is kind of going to be like a... kind of a wrapping up a few ideas and thoughts that we didn't cover last week. But in... Um, and Genesis chapter 6, verse 13 says this, And God said unto Noah, The end of all flesh is come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them, and behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Just as way of review, as we mentioned last week, that would be impossible because Noah was flesh, his wife was flesh, his sons and, and daughter-in-laws were flesh, and then all the animals as well. Yes? And so were these uh, sons of God, these men of renown, that were uh, men of before time and also after that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So we know that all doesn't always mean a universal all. We kind of get this alluded to in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 15, which is often brought up when it comes to the flood, which says this, and spared not the old world, but saved Noah and the eight person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly. Now many people will use this verse and say, see, it has to mean a worldwide flood. It seems to be alluding to that. But listen to what it says. It says the world of the ungodly. Now that word world there is cosmos. It can mean a lot of different things, but it... One way that it can be uh, used is an order. 
uh, a arrangement of things. In this case, an arrangement of ungodly men. And if you read in Genesis 6, uh, the, the earth there, the land, was corrupt with violence. The people had corrupted it with unrighteousness. So what he's saying here is the flood came upon the the flood came upon the world of the ungodly. Often, like we would say today, the world is corrupt today, and we will say that. But do we mean everything in the earth is corrupt? Uh, no, not necessarily. Well, we we may say the world is evil today. Do we mean everything is evil? Exactly, universally, not exactly. Um, to give you a, another way of how this word cosmos is used, in Colossians chapter 2, verse 8, it says this, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after t the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, cosmos, and not after Christ. Now, are we to think that Peter is, uh, in, in Colossians here, it is warning us of the philosophies and traditions of men or the principles of the ground? No. It's, he's using a figure of speech. It's the principles of the ungodly, the principles of the traditions of men. And um, I think that's what Peter is alluding to here. He is saying the flood came upon the world of the ungodly, not necessarily the whole world. Now let's turn back to Genesis 6 and let's look at verse 4. This one here is pretty significant to me. I think um, a lot of people overlook this, but it is significant, and there's a lot of uh, speculation that people go through to answer it. But it says here, There were giants in the earth in those days, and, af and also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, and the same became mighty men, which were of old men of renown. Let's just ask her this question. If the flood was worldwide, why does it say here in 4 that there was giants in the days before and, the, and after? Goliath was a giant, was he not? Now, many believe that the flood was meant to destroy the giants, but if that was the case, then God failed. I read an article this week that said that uh, basically what happened was God destroyed the flood to kill the giants, and then the fallen angels came down and did the exact same thing over again and said, Ha! Gotcha, God. That would make God out to be like this over-tempered um, deity that just decided, got mad and to wipe the earth out, and then those little crea creations of His, if that's what they are, went in and just fooled you. Doesn't make any sense. Um, they were there afterwards. Now the question is, is how were they there afterwards? Were they on the ark? Were did they float on the ark like a, like a, a pool noodle? Um, did they build a boat, an ark? I mean, did they? What happened? Um, I think it's obvious that the text here is saying that they were there afterwards, after this flood. It's letting us know that they were at, there after, too. Um, I think that makes much more sense. Now, there's a lot of different theories in that passage alone, but the, the, no matter what you think about that passage, there was giants before and there was giants after. How did they get there after? If God was just destroying the, the flood or the world with the flood just to destroy the giants, then it just makes God out to be a failure. And I don't think it was. I think God accomplished exactly what He was wanting to accomplish, and that was to destroy that world of the ungodly during that time. He wanted to wipe it out, much like Sodom and Gomorrah, except much bigger. So, obviously, that's something to consider. Now let's turn to Genesis chapter 7, verse 18 through 20. And it says here, And the waters prevailed and were increased greatly upon the earth, and the ark went up upon the face of the waters. And the waters prevailed exceedingly upon the earth, and all the high hills that were under the whole heaven were covered. Fifty cubits upward did the waters prevail, and the mountains were covered. Now, if you understand this verse to mean the whole world, then it sounds like that the waters truly exceeded fifty cubits above the highest mountain. Now, if Mount Everest is the highest mountain at this moment in time, it's 29,031 feet. So we have to come to the conclusion that 
if Mount Everest is, existed at this point, moment in time, that the flood was over that. Now, if that be the case, then Noah's gonna have to have oxygen equipment. It's gonna be very cold up there because of how the high altitude. Now, many people that adhere to a worldwide flood, they would say, well, Mount Everest and all the mountains uh, were created afterwards. They would say that basically the flood caused all these issues in the earth and the mount uh, there was no mountains other than some high hills and things like that. And then all these huge mountains came up afterwards. That's not what it says either though. It doesn't say that. And that honestly is an argument that Scripture neither supports or confirms or denies or anything like that. It's just, it's a, it's a theory. Um, and... I think that the global flood view, you have to do a lot of theories, a lot of speculating to get to that view. Um, I just think that it, a lot of guessing, you know, like the dinosaurs. You've got to put the dinosaurs on there. Well, before we found dinosaurs, no one worried about that. You find dinosaurs, you've got to put them on the ark too, um, and things like that. You go to areas of the, the world that uh, you have the layers of sediment and things like that. They basically say that the flood caused all that. Even though we can observe layers of sediment today being formed much smaller areas than these large areas. Anyway, there's lots of different articles and books written on that. I don't really want to get into all that today. But those who subscribe to the local flood view understand that this word hill and mountain are the same word. They're the same Hebrew word. It's the Hebrew word hair. Uh, not like hair like uh, on your head, but it's H-A-R. And uh, it just means hill. People from out in uh, Denver, that's what they call the Eastern Kentucky Mountains. That's actually a good point. To my face. Dude. Because <laughs> that's actually a really good point. I never thought about that. Because in Kentucky, where we used to live, um, we call those big hills mountains. And uh, you go out to Colorado, and they call those big mountains hills. But... That's, just, that's an interesting point. What I think is going on here is from the perspective of Noah and his family, which if you read this account, it is from their perspective, all the high hills and all the high mountains in their perspective area were covered. Now, that would make sense. Um, now, they're in the land of their Eretz as it is in the Hebrew, the land of their Eretz, all the high hills and all the high mountains, or hills. It's interesting in that passage, it's the same Hebrew word for both words, mountain or hill. So, I do want to point out, though, this has been pointed out to me this week, the phrase here, under the whole heaven. Let's talk about that for a second. It was pointed out to me that this word here, this phrase, is used eight times in Scripture. And it seems that all eight times that it is meant for the whole heaven, except maybe this time. Now, I will admit that does put a mark for a worldwide flood. Because if this is a one-time event that this phrase is being used, it would point in favor of a worldwide flood. But then the issue I have with that is then we have to ignore everything that we've already discussed. So is this a figure of speech? Is it talking about the whole heaven from the perspective of Noah and his family? Possibly. And uh, we won't go through all eight verses. You can look it up. Um, but under the whole heaven, just search the, that phrase. And um, you'll find that it seems to mean in all those passages that that is what it's talking about. Uh, the question is, is that what it's talking about in this passage? Now, it's just something to consider. Uh, it's something that often gets brought up, and it's good to keep in mind. Okay, uh, Genesis chapter 8, verse 5. says here, And the waters decreased continually until the tenth month. In the tenth month, on the first day of the month, were the tops of the mountains seen. Now, keep that in mind, because it's so it appears from this passage, in this passage, that the land is starting to become visible. And the water is reciting. Do you all understand when you read that passage when it says, on the first day of the month were the tops of the mountain seen, would that make sense that the water was going down? Well, let's read on in verse 6. And it came to pass at the end of forty days that Noah opened the window of the ark which he had made, and he sent forth a raven which went forth 
to and fro unto the waters were dry until excuse me until the waters were dried up from the earth. Also he sent forth a dove from him to see if the waters were abated from the, off the face of the ground. Verse 9. And the dove found no rest for the sole of, his, of her feet, excuse me, of her foot. And she returned unto him unto the ark, for the waters were on the face of the whole earth. Then he put forth his hand and took her and pulled her in unto, unto him unto the ark. Now, which is it? Are mountaintops coming above? Are they drying off? Can you see them in the distance? If so, why is he now sending ravens and doves to see if there's dry ground if he sees dry mountains? What does that mean? Uh, now, global flood view will say that he saw them under the water. Looked down and saw the tops of mountains under the water. Um, I don't think that makes much sense, but that's what they say. That's the, that's the response. Um, so, if we have here Noah sending out ravens and doves to see if the water had abated from the ground, the Eretz, and if the mountaintops could be seen, why was there no place for the dove to rest its foot? Now, if we understand this passage to mean the whole world, then we have to have a contradiction in this passage because we can't have both at the same time if this means the whole world. Now, if it means the whole ground in which Noah was looking at, it would make much more sense and we would have no contradiction because you can't rest a, a boat like the ark on the very tip top of mountains off in the distance. You may be able to see them, but they're all way off there. So if we take this as a perspective view of what Noah was seeing. He's seeing mountains off in the distance, so he lets a dove and a raven out to see if perhaps there's land closer by to him, closer by, that way he can press the ark upon. So that's what he does. Um, if you look at it upon that view, there is no contradiction. Now let's move to verse uh, Genesis chapter 8, verse 13. And we see another verse in which this interpretation would make much more sense. And it came to pass in the six hundredth and first year, in the first month, the first day of the month, the waters were dried up from off the earth. And Noah removed the cover of the ark and looked, and behold, the face of the ground was dry. Now, think about that for a moment. Now, think about literalism. Th those who view... The worldwide flood are all about literalism. If it says the whole earth, it means the whole earth. If it means the whole heaven, it means the whole heaven. Um, but, let's read it again. And it came to pass in the 601st year, in the first month, the first day of the month, the waters were dried up from off the earth. And Noah removed the cover of the ark and looked, and behold, the face of the ground was dry. Were the oceans dried up? Remember, that word ground there is the same word for earth. If we take this 100% literal, then we have to assume that every molecule of water is dried up off the face of the earth. Because that's what it says. Now we know from the context, though, that's not what's being said. It's talking about the flood waters, not every bit of water that is in that area. If it, He's in a boat. He is. So how would it be dried up? Well, it's talking about how the earth is dried up underneath him. So the flood, the context of the passage is the flood waters are residing. Um, the issue is, though, if you take this 100% literally, you have to say all the seas dried up, all the ponds, all the lakes, everything. All water, as it says here, were dried up off the earth, and Noah removed the cover of the ark and looked, and behold, the face of the Eretz was dry. How would they survive if there was no water? Now, worldwide flood proponents will say that I'm being silly, but we have to look at that passage and look at it that way. Um, that's the amount of water we cut off all the white vegetation. That's another issue. I can't remember if I mentioned it last week. The salt water. Now, this is getting more into the, the scientific view of it, not the scriptural view, but let's just face it. If the entire world was covered in salt, how could an olive tree germinate, the seed germinate, sprout, and make leaves in this moment in time. 
let's just I don't want to focus too much on that the scientific view of it and the biology and you know geology of it but that is something that is to can be considered um, I'm trying to look at just scripture but it's hard to ignore things like that so let's look at some objections um, one objection I wrote down here is um, some will say, well, if it wasn't worldwide, then why did people just walk out when it started to rain? Now, I think we can all have a really good perspective on this if we remember the 2016 flood. Could the people in Denham just walk out and start walking out when it started to rain? Or even up here. I knew people that went were watching TV in their living room and 20 minutes later they were chopping a hole in their attic to get out of their roof because they were going to drown. Uh, and that flood we had I think 24 inches in 24 hours and that's not including all the other rain after that. Um, there was no, and that's a little flood, that is a little flood compared to what we're talking about here. Um, there was no walking out, there was no warning. You know, so, and we'll talk about the size of what people think this area was here in a minute. But if you're talking about an area basically the size of Texas, Mississippi, and Louisiana, where are you going to walk to? In the time, I mean, if it starts raining, obviously they didn't heed Noah's warnings, the madman out there building the ark. Where are they going to walk to? They wouldn't. They would die. It was just raining. They were going to die. Uh, and, uh, and honestly, they were wicked men. Their hearts were probably so hard that they didn't care when it started to rain. That what would be the point? So I think that's silly. Uh, maybe somebody in the desert may come to that conclusion. I don't know. Uh, but even in the desert, when it rains, it floods quickly. Um, remember in Odessa, I mean, there's no drainage. It's just flat, you know. So I don't think that's a very good objection. They could just walk out. We're not talking about something the size of a county or something like that. We're talking about something probably in the area of 350,000 square mile area. Uh, it'd be like someone it, starting to rain in Dallas and somebody had to walk to Biloxi. Um, they'd be dead already. Um, another objection was, is uh, some will say that the flood, a local flood, a regional flood, would not accomplish what God wanted to accomplish. And this isn't necessarily true. This is not true. Um, like I stated before, the objection of the flood was to wipe out the world, world of the ungodly. Whatever that objection was, God accomplished. Um, if you say that he was to wipe out all the giants and there's giants afterwards, he didn't accomplish what he accomplished, which a lot of these people will say that. Uh, other people that adhere to the satanic seed line doctrine, they will say that it was to wipe out the Cain, the Cain seed. But then they say it's on the ark or something, it survived. Yet again, God failed. All Yeah. So, whatever, the, whatever God wanted to accomplish... He accomplished it. He destroyed those people um, to the point where Noah and his family were the only people left in that area. Um, and so the people that say, well, that, uh, a, a local or regional flood doesn't accomplish what God wanted, if you look at their doctrine, a lot of times it doesn't, their view doesn't accomplish it either because they let something through. Not everybody, but some people. Another objection. What, would, what need would there be for the ark? If it was a regional flood, why would there be an ark needed? Um, a lot of times they'll say, why didn't Noah just walk out? Why didn't God tell him to get a caravan of people and walk out and with all the animals? Um, I think there's two things here that people misunderstand. For one, the size of the flood. When we say local or regional, we're not talking about something small. And also, if the land was filled with violence, how hard do you think it would have been for <coughs> Noah and his family and all these animals to parade across wherever and go wherever. Do you think that they would have been killed? I'm just throwing it out there. It's just an idea. Um, those who... There's a lot of different theories on where the, the regional flood was, but most people that adhere to a local flood 
theory is their view. They look at the Tarim Basin over there, and I didn't get a map to show you all this morning, but it's a large area, about 350,000 square miles over there, just east of the Middle East, um, between China and over there. It's a big valley. Yeah, there's a map there, right there. Um, that is where most people believe that it happened. There's also people that believe it was the Black Sea. There's people that believe that it was actually the Mediterranean Sea and the Pillars of Hercules opened up and it flooded there or whatever. Um, I think the Terran Basin is probably more probable. But uh, regardless of where it is, the, uh, we're talking about an area about 350,000 square miles, roughly, just an estimate. To give you an idea, the Great Mississippi Flood of 1927 which was the most destructive river flood in the United States, uh, covered an area of 27,000 square miles. 27,000 versus 350,000. I'm sorry? We read up on that. <laughs> uh, the Great Mississippi and Missouri River floods from 1993 covered an area of 30,000 square miles. 30,000 versus 350,000. Now the reason I bring these two up is I, I watched a video this past week of two men advocating for a global flood. And they, they used these two floods as an example. And uh, basically their whole point was is these floods here would prove that God broke His promise if it was a regional flood because these floods were all so massive uh, that it would, uh, it would, God would have broken His promise and basically His promise for a regional flood uh, just doesn't make any sense with the rainbow and His promise not to flood the land. My issue with this is, is they said in this video that the 1993 Mississippi and Missouri flood was 320 thousand square miles. That's what they said. Now I don't think they were purposely lying um, to support their view, but rather they were confused. If you look it up, uh, according to the National Weather Service, there was around 400,000 square miles affected, not submerged, affected. To give you a perspective of this, um, Let's see here. 300, let's see, where did I have it here? 350,000 square miles would be the equivalent land mass of Texas, Louisiana, and Mississippi. I thought I had wrote the figures down, but I didn't. So if 320,000 square miles of land were submerged underwater in 1993, that means Texas, Louisiana, and Mississippi would have been submerged. Would we not remember that? Where we would be sitting now, if they'd been the area, would have been submerged, underwater. And if we take it to the biblical account, it would have been underwater by a lot. Now, I don't think those two men that did that presentation were lying purposely. They just didn't know what they were talking about. Now, the flood, like I said, was around 30,000. That's less than 10% of what we're talking about. So... This is no little flood, and I think that's where the confusion is. This is a massive flood. Another objection is concerning Matthew 24. Um, Matthew 24, verse 37 says this. It says here, But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Very popular verse. A lot, a lot of times people will take this verse and they'll say, those who take that Matthew 24 is talking about the second coming of Christ, they'll say that would be a worldwide event. And why would Jesus be using a local or regional event to talk about His return? Now, I don't want to get into it this morning in detail, but if you remember about two years ago, we went into Matthew 24 and I did a two-part series on it talking about it's basically referring to the destruction of Jerusalem and the events going up, leading up to that day. And this passage in 37 where it says, The Son of Man coming... Uh, I'm sorry, not 37, 36. The Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. No, that's not 36. Hold on. Verse 37. Is it 37? 
I'm sorry, it's verse 30. Uh, it was the one I'm reading. Where it says, The Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and glory. If you remember from that series, I pointed out how that's prophetic language for destruction. Basically, it's prophetic Old Testament type language, prophetic language, speaking of God destroying somebody. Uh, we won't turn there, but 2 Samuel chapter 22, Psalms 97, 2, Isaiah 19, Daniel 7, 13, Exodus 16, 10, are all verses that use that type of language, talking about how uh, like God rode on a cloud against the Egyptians in the battle. Well, we know that He didn't physically ride on a cloud. It's speaking of it's prophetic language, warring. Um, now, my point with all this, without going down that rabbit trail, is the prophecy given in Matthew 24 by Jesus is a regional event. The famine spoken about here was a regional event. The earthquakes were regional events. Uh, the people here in... Um, well, it says here in verse 16, Let them which be in, the, in Judah flee unto the mountains. Well, we know that the Judeans there that heeded the warnings, they fled to Pella in the mountains in so many different aspects. It was a regional event um, which would fall in line with the Noah, the Noah flood event. Um, it was no small event either. It wasn't even just Jerusalem. The things we're talking about here was the entire Mediterranean area. So... That gets into a whole field of study there, but from my perspective, that's speaking about a what we would call a regional event, the destruction of Jerusalem, not necessarily the second coming of Jesus. Okay, so if Noah's flood was worldwide, a lot of times people will ask, what about the animals? Now this is more of a scientific zoology type question, but what about all the animals? How does he fit them all in the ark? Now there's a million theories for this. Everything that he stunted them all, he went out and got the smallest of them. So it wasn't a full sheep, it was a little lamb. It was, um, uh, there was one thing I read about how basically animals, uh, they will stay small if you keep them in a small cage, kind of like a chicken. So he put everything in small cages when they were infants, so they stayed small. And then when he let them loose, they grew larger. Um, DNA strands in a cryo chamber, you haven't heard that one? I hadn't heard that one. I have heard, though, something similar. Now, basically, now this is a form of evolution here, um, which is interesting because people say they don't believe in evolution will spout this theory. They'll say that basically there was one type of dog, and those dogs turned in that dog turned into a bunch of breeds. There's even uh, uh, like there was one lion, and it turned into a cheetah and a tiger and a house cat, all from that one one thing. Um, uh, the bugs, I don't know what they do with the bugs. Um, the freshwater fish, they never touched the freshwater fish because they would all die. Um, and they never, they do touch on the dinosaurs and things like that, but that's kind of what they do. Um, I want to read out of page 29. Uh, Charles Wiseman wrote a book, Facts and Fiction, regarding Noah's Flood. It's not a very big book, but he kind of lays out this argument. And he goes, uh, he touches on scriptural points, but he also touches on scientific points as well. And he said this in the book uh, concerning the animals. Uh, it's somewhat of a long quote, but I think you all will enjoy it. It says here, Noah was commanded to bring two of every animal and creeping thing unto the ark, but of every clean beast and of the fowl of the air, he was to bring in by sevens, Genesis 7, 2 through 3. There currently exist 200,000 species of animals, over 900,000 species of insects, and about 450 species of plants. We could estimate the number of clean animals along with all the birds to be about one-sixth of animals or 33,000 in number. Thus Noah would have needed, more room, or needed room for 231,000 clean animals, seven times 33,000. 334,000 unclean animals, 2 times 167,000, and 1,800,000 insects, 2 times nine, uh, 900,000. A squirrel or a rabbit would need about 3 cubic feet of space. An elephant, would, it would need about 14 cubic feet of space. A turkey would need about 9 cubic feet. A uh, 15-foot crocodile would need a, and a 6 
100 pound gorilla each require 140 cubic feet of space. A fox would take up 10 cubic feet of space, a lion 120, and a 20 foot tall giraffe would require 900 cubic feet of space. We could just we could justly figure 10 cubic feet of space per animal on the average and about 0 0.05 cubic feet of space for insects. This would also include the space needed for their, st their stalls, cages, and containers, etc. We have to also consider food for the animals which God told Noah to bring on the ark. Six, Genesis 6.21 since Noah and the animals were in the ark just over a year, there would have to be stored space for one year's supply of food on average. A person can eat about 1,300 pounds of food a year, which is about seven times his weight in food. An elephant can eat about 60,000 pounds of food a year, which is seven to eight times its weight. The average ox or cow can consume 14, excuse me, 24,000 pounds of food a year, which is about 14 times its weight. One wolf can eat a sheep a week, or 52 sheep a year, which is about 20 times its weight, while a lion can eat about 35 times its weight. A shrew can eat several hundred times its weight in a year. Since the weight of many types of food, such as hay, is less dense than body weight, they would occupy much more space. It would be more than fair than to consider eight times the space needed on average for the food storage for each animal and insect." End quote. He goes on, and that was a lot of reading. Um, he goes on to give this table in the book and uh, estimates the space needed for all this would have been 51,660,720 cubic feet needed, which means Noah would have needed 43 arcs to accomplish this task. Now, the reason I bring this up is this is something an atheist will throw at a Christian and say, this is what you believe. Now, the worldwide flood proponents will come out with all these theories and, and try to make it, but these are facts. I mean, we have to look at them and understand that they exist. Um, so it's something we have to address. So th there's a lot more that I could say concerning the flood, but we've pretty much went ahead and we've addressed the argument for a local flood. We could look at all the different scientific evidence and the geology evidence and everything like that, but in Scripture though, we've looked at it. It's simple as the word Eretz and figures of speech and things like that. Um, the global flood should not fear investigation. Neither should the regional flood. So, this is the view. Um, there is hundreds of books on the worldwide flood. Most of them are comical. I mean, I, I have some of them at the house. They are comical. Um, there are fewer ones on a regional flood, but in my opinion, they, it makes more sense with Scripture and with the world around us. Um, but this whole message, this series, was supposed to be just to focus on Scripture. Um, I want to read a quote uh, out of the same book by Charles Wiseman that he has right at the end. And I think it's something good to consider. It says this, Facts versus speculation. Thus who take the position of a literal worldwide flood are for forced to engage in a considerable speculation in order to support their position. Some of these speculative arguments, which are unfounded and unsupported by facts from Scripture, history, or science, include the following. That God had created more water than originally existed, and then after the flood made most of it disappear. That other races of man were brought on the ark, or that all races evolve out of one family. That all the species of life had been gathered from every corner of the globe and then somehow redistributed to their original locations and habitats after the flood. That all species of life in groups of two or seven and all the required food for a year easily fit within the limited space of an ark. Kind of like... Uh, Doctor Who, right? <laughs> <laughs> that uh, all types of marine life could have survived the fresh water of the flood rains. Dan, can you put uh, salt water in these tanks back here? Okay, I didn't think so. 
that all strata and sedimentary formations were formed rapidly within less than a year instead of millions of years. That the great mountains did exist five it did not exist 5000 years ago but had undergone uplifting or creation by the flood afterwards that the antediluvian ge geology, geology uh, sorry geographic which existed prior to the flood was radically different from the geography lay uh, layout that exists today basically the world was different uh, with the land that's why they talk about like the continents separating that natural and geological process did not always occur at a uniform and pre predictable rate. These and other claims are derived from predictions and speculations based on the belief that a universal flood occurred. They are not specific or provable facts. The true scientific application requires one to objectively gather and examine all data and facts and use them to arrive at a conclusion. End quote. So, without getting into each one of those, you do. You have to jump to some conclusions. And, um, and I think you have to jump to more conclusions doing a worldwide flood than a local. So, that's the end of my message. There's not much more I can really say on that uh, that I want to say. I could go on and on and on. But I think that basically lays out the regional flood point of view and what we believe and how we believe it and how it just makes more sense in Scripture. Um, real quick before I close, I do want to give some books that go into a lot more detail than these for someone to consider. Um, Facts and Fiction Regarding Noah's Flood by Charles Wiseman. It is not in print, but you can find it online. Noah's Flood, Joshua's Long Day, and Lucifer's Fall by Ralph Woodrow. Uh, real good book. Tracing Our Ancestors by Frederick Heiberman. It was written in like 1934. And then God's Covenant Creation, Adam's Race and Mandate by Lawrence Blanchard. That's his book four. Uh, he's got three chapters on Noah's Flood that are really good. And there's more out there, but those are the ones that uh, give a regional flood perspective. And uh, there's a hundred different ones on Amazon you can look for a global flood perspective. Um, before we close, does anyone have any comments? Ideas? Just that uh, if you look at other historical materials from around the world, it's clear that there was something big going on. Mm -hmm. Or there would be all these different stories that all kind of matter. I think everything was jumbled up and the Lord uh, used His manner of fixing it. And I'm glad that He did. Can you imagine how bad things would be now? We sit around here now looking at what appears to be a Batman movie every time we turn on the news and see what's uh, on with all the crazy running around. Can you imagine how bad it would have been if it was not 6,000 years ago? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I was going to say, I think um, one of the, the most proving things that it's the giants. Mm -hmm. We have evidence of people plowing them up mm -hmm. later on in the U.S. Yeah. So you you couldn't have, where did they where did they come from? Exactly. They were around that much later. And some people say that they were they were that was they were wiped out. They were wiped out before the flood, but the text says they weren't. And then we have Goliath. So that's it's clear. And the newspapers say yeah. they weren't. Um, indeed. And also, uh, the animal, the animals that were taken two by two, a lot of them would have to inbreed. That's another thing: is uh, incestuous relationships yeah. even in both man and animals oh, that is an issue. Um, so, uh, yeah, that is a good point. Um, and you run into that issue if all man, which is another subject in itself, if all man came from Noah's family. Well, let's go ahead and close in prayers. Anyone have anything else? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank You, Lord, for this day. We thank You for this opportunity, Lord, to just study this passage in Scripture, Lord, and look at it at a different point of view, Lord. And we just we thank You, Lord, for that, Lord. And uh, we just praise You and we thank You for any time that we have to be able to come together, Lord, as a group and uh, talk about Scripture and study Your Word, Lord. And we just praise You and we thank You, Lord, for all things. And but we, Lord, we thank You, Lord, for the understanding that we have. And we don't claim to to know everything, Lord, but uh, 
we were open. Uh, everyone in this room is open to uh, correction, Lord, and we just we thank you, Lord, for the knowledge that you have given us, Lord, because we live in a world, Lord, that knowledge just isn't valued very much at all, Lord. And we just uh, we thank you for what we do have, and we ask you, Lord, to correct us where we need to be corrected, and uh, let us grow, Lord, and more more knowledge, Lord. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus Christ, the name above all names. Amen.